Okay. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about microcatheters, kind of when to use them, how to use them, what's available for us to use. There's been a lot of changes in this area. I'm just going to start with the case, just showing uh, this is actually a CTO case, but we'll talk about a lot of different things with microcatheters. But you can see here it's a proximal uh, blunt cap on a, on a circumflex. It's already been attempted elsewhere. And uh, you don't have a lot of distance to get a wire down, and you're going to use a, you know, if you're going to go antegrade, you're going to need a more supportive microcatheter typically. Uh, and you can see in another view, if uh, this case was actually referred specifically to consider retrograde, and you can see that's a terrible uh, uh, tortuous epicardial from an LAD to the circumflex. So you're going to have to pick a very different microcatheter if you're going to, going to do something that's more tortuous. And fortunately, they've made the catheters much better just to show you. Uh, this is an LP, a, uh, a turnpike LP, all the tortuosity that it can take fairly, uh, fairly nicely. And occasionally, once you bring it through there, it straightens out. So if you look now in this view, some of that tortuosity can be a little scary sometimes, but usually you have to really gently torque the catheter as you go through to decrease the resistance, and then it allows your wire to go all the way up through the cap and finish the case. And we, on this case, kind of wired both directions just in case we had trouble and had to uh, close something, but there was no issue. So one of the first microcatheters that we used in complex cases commonly, there's a lot of old ones that I'm not going to really cover, like the Fine Cross and the Cordis Transit, things like that. But then they came out with the Corsair series and now the Corsair Pro, which the Corsair Pro is even better than the original Corsair. This is really a catheter you torque more counterclockwise. Uh, it has uh, uh, wires that are braided, eight thinner and two thicker wires. It gives it incredible transmission of torque and it protects your wire so it doesn't uh, kink on the wire so you can go through a lot of tortuosity. And now they also have the Corsair Pro XS which has been released just uh, in, a, in a few sites but from what I'm hearing it's been a, a significant improvement. You can see on the left there the tip becomes very tapered down to 1.3 French. And so you can go through retrogrades and epicardials and things uh, reasonably safely and effectively. Uh, the Turnpike series is also very popular. I think uh, this is probably one of the more common ones used as well. Originally there was the regular standard, but now most people are using primarily the Spiral and the LP. Uh, the LP is low profile, so it's the Turnpike uh, low profile version. It's about, uh, it's almost twice as flexible as the regular Turnpike. Uh, this, this turnpike series you generally torque clockwise, so it's the opposite of the course there, you clock, go clockwise, but with the LP you can go both directions. You try not to go more than 10 in one direction so that you don't kink it or, or injure it. It's important to transmit the uh, force. And it's got a bi-directional uh, dual layer coil that allows it to uh, transmit that, tor that torque without uh, kinking. The spiral we use for a lot of antegrade cases, it's a little slightly larger, a little more supportive. You can see here maybe on the right there it has a nylon coil and distal two centimeters that allows you to engage the lesion a little better. And uh, I think if you have a tough antegrade case that you're trying to get through, the, this is great. You don't use this at all retrograde for uh, complex cases. All of these catheters are great, not necessarily for CTOs, but especially if you're trying just to get used to them for your complex cases. We use them sometimes if we're going to maybe do a rotoblader. And we don't want to start with the roto floppy wire frequently, so we'll use uh, our workhorse wire and a microcatheter to get down and then switch out for our roto floppy wire. But there's a lot of different cases that uh, it can be nice to have a microcatheter. Uh, Boston has just come out with their Mamba and their Mamba Flex catheters, which I think uh, have not been widely released yet, but, uh, but I think everybody can get them now, so that'll be another option. And this is just an example of how to spin these catheters. Uh, this is James Spratt. You can see his left hand is pinching and kind of for pushing forward toward the guide. His right hand is spinning. So you'll see how fast his hand is spinning there. It's important. Occasionally you'll see people just barely turn them every little bit, but you really want to spin the catheter to transmit the torque. Uh, from the case we saw earlier this morning, the live case, sometimes it's nice to have a, a microcatheter in your lab. Your peripheral guys may have one that has a little larger lumen in case you have to deliver something larger for, um, for perforation or uh, at least know your, what you have. So if you have coils that go through an 014 system um, or, or, or what your uh, devices are, so if you do get in trouble, you're not trying to figure out what you have uh, in a case. This can be helpful for all kinds of complex cases, not necessarily CTOs. 
I just want to mention the, uh, the dual lumen catheter, the twin pass, the original one was just the regular twin pass. They now have the twin pass torque, which is a little bit uh, improved. And you can see on the right, it has a shorter tip, so it's only seven millimeters. And now the marker bands are on both sides of the over the wire port, so the second port that you would use. So it allows you to know a little better where your wire is coming out. And it's also angled a little bit, so it's a 10 degree angle when your wire comes out. And this is just a cartoon. If you look at the upper right, uh, if, you're, uh, if your wire is going down the, uh, the branch, uh, then you can bring your microcatheter in and not necessarily lose wire access and bring your wire out the upper port in the upper right cartoon here just to show if you had to go through a lesion uh, but you didn't want to lose access with your first wire. This allows you to have one microcatheter. And also it's nice, you know, more, and maybe in more of your complex cases, but if you have severe angulation, sometimes it's helpful to have an angled catheter. We don't use these very often. We use the middle two uh, occasionally, the 90 degree turn on the supercross and the 120 degree. And this can be helpful, especially if you have a retroflexed circumflex. You know how sometimes you bring your wire down, it's so curved, every time you get past the proximal vessel, it prolapses into the LED. Uh, or if you have a diagonal that's really sharply angled, sometimes this can speed up a case or allow it to uh, progress. And then I uh, just uh, want to just show you one other case that uh, I think is really, you might say, well, this looks kind of like an easy case, but you can see this has a real proximal circumflex. This patient had inferolateral ischemia and has a proximal lesion. There's a giant uh, obtuse marginal, and then there's a lesion in the AV groove there in the proximal circ that's uh, uh, fairly significant. And in this case, every time you bring the wire around, we tried a couple different wires, it wants to, uh, even if you can turn it into that branch, it always wants to prolapse back into the marginal. And uh, we've had this several times. If you look carefully, you'll see a little atrial type branch coming off that proximal right after the lesion. And uh, in this case, we just um, bring the wire, uh, when, when we do get it down the circumflex, we can get it into the branch, but it won't turn down into the AV groove segment. And the wire does want to go out that atrial branch. So you can use that branch to your benefit just to give you a little more wire support. You can see here the wire goes out the branch. And then when you bring your microcatheter down, this was either a Corsair Pro or a Turnpike LP, uh, you spin it gently as it comes around. And that allows you to make those turns without prolapsing it either into the marginal or into the LED. And kind of we follow it all the way up almost to the atrial branch. And then you pull the wire back and you'll see the catheter really just drop right into the branch. See it drop right here. And then your wire comes down and you can just uh, intervene and, and stint it uh, with a lot less effort. So it can shorten your case and, and allow you to do some uh, tortuosity and angles that uh, I think are much tougher to do with a balloon uh, uh, case. And I'd, I'd say try your microcatheters uh, before you get into a real tough case. Get used to spinning them, spend some time at the booth so you know how to hold them and work your hands together with them. And that's all. Thank you. So that's a great overview, and uh, thanks for that, that case is a perfectly illustrative case. I mean, there's still a lot of labs that don't have dedicated coronary microcatheters and uh, folks using over-the-wire balloons, which the technology is just vastly outstripped those, and so I don't really see a sense um, or a need for those anymore when you can use these types of devices. Um, maybe talk a little bit about how, once the microcatheter is down, getting it out. Anybody want to go through that? Or, yeah, I actually had a little, we're short on time, but um, I took it out. But there's a couple things you can do to take it out. So if you use an anti-grade catheter like the, like the spiral and you drill it clockwise into the lesion, you want to unclock it when you come out. So you do the opposite direction. It's not so important with the LP or the Corsair Pro, but it is important if you're using the spiral or the gold. Uh, the other thing is you can, once you get it out, you've got a long catheter in there, so you either have to trap or do something to get your not lose wire position. We don't use a lot of long wires anymore, a lot of short wires, and we do a fair amount of hydraulic exchanges. If you haven't gotten used to that, uh, it's become very popular for everyone in our lab now that uh, we either do it by, you know, getting the wire all the way down in the microcatheter and then injecting a little saline into the tip as you bring the catheter back. If you're not too worried about losing access, or you can even do it with your end deflator uh, very safely, or you can just trap. Trap's probably the safest way so you don't lose wire position. And so by trapping, you inflate a balloon that's not on a wire in the guide um, that's distal to the microcatheter that you've removed. 
the wire stays fixed and you can take your microcatheter out. You then deflate the trapping balloon, but the key thing is you gotta make it bleed back because if you don't bleed back, then you can have air that yet, yet when you next inject will get entrained into the vessel. So bleed everything back through the TUI and through the, uh, the, the side port and then you're good to go. I would like to mention a little tip that I found out the hard way. Um, sometimes, you know, when we cross a, a difficult lesion and we inject some uh, dye to see if we're in the lumen, um, and then we would try to walk out our, our, our microcatheter. Well, because of the dye that is still in the um, uh, in the microcatheter, the wire may get stuck, and you know, after crossing a CTO, getting everything out is not exactly what you want. So, I would recommend uh, injecting a little bit of saline, so this way you flush the uh, the dye out and you're able to walk out your wire. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, typically, we, we frown from doing distal injections unless you're trying to wire sort of a, a collateral um, to confirm wire position, because you can usually do that by sort of retrograde injection and advancing the wire. But if you do have dye in there, you have to make sure you get that dye out. Uh, Anand, any, any thoughts on how you use microcatheters in your practice? on. Okay. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, these braided catheters are particularly useful. I think people who start doing CTO techniques, one of the advantages is you become very comfortable with uh, these catheters in non-CTO cases. And I think that's where uh, really the advantage of getting that skill set down is that you become comfortable with these uh, different types of catheters. Yeah, and the spinning we mentioned in the live case earlier is definitely something that takes practice. Um, you think it's very straightforward and then you do it, it doesn't cross, and if you're being proctored or with somebody else who does it, I mean, they'll get the catheter to fly down. And you feel inadequate for like the first 10 times you do it, and then it actually takes practice. So it, it's important to do that. It's also important to use them uh, and really focus on fixing the wire position because in tough cases, there's gonna be an interaction where things are moving in and out as well. Yeah, I just mentioned uh, it's really a one-man thing too. It's if once you have someone else fixing the wire with your microcatheter while you're working it, it's really better to have do it. Even if you've got somebody great beside you, it's really better to be a one person and get used to using your right hand and your left hand. And I just encourage you to stop by a booth of one of these companies and have them work with you a little bit because it's not natural, uh, and and uh, you don't want to do a hundred cases before you learn how to use it right. And, and people that do it right, you're controlling the wire and potentially advancing or retracting the wire at the same time as you're spinning and transmitting with your other hand. So it's, The same it's uh, motor skill set will help people with cross boss and Vions catheters uh, for CTO crossing. So I think it's the same kind of uh, mechanical memory that you can develop. All right, great. Thanks so much.